And all right, you may be seated. Man, this is, I'm not going to lie, a way better turnout than I thought was going to be here after I read of bad weather and cold and storms and snow and everything. And you, here you are. Here you are. You know, I put on Facebook, I said, hey, we don't care about a little bit of bad weather. I didn't actually think that anyone would actually like, hey, yeah, we don't really care about bad weather. But here you are. You know, it's kind of funny. I always, I always like wonder like when you guys go home, what you say about your pastor? Because, you know, it's, it's one of those things that when the pastor goes along, I'm sure you're like, oh man, that was a long message today or whatever. But, oh, well, thank you. Uh, but what I kind of wondered was like, when you look at the chairs and the way they're set up, I'm missing like, there's like five people in the front three rows and everyone else behind them. It's like, that's a good turnout. But I'm like, what do you guys say about when we get home? Like, we don't sit in the splash zone. Like he's just... <laughs> Everywhere he goes, he's just throwing stuff everywhere. No, uh, but so here's where we're at. Last, uh, last week, Pastor Sandy was out here because Thursday we did our Valentine's Day dinner, which was awesome, by the way, right? We, who was at that thing? Raise your hand, right? Wasn't that awesome? I thought it was awesome and I clapped. So that's all that matters. Um, Panda Express did a great job. The contestants were hilarious. But even funnier was the day before when Pastor Sandy was here because he said, you know, he's from Stone Mountain, Georgia. And uh, he said to me, because I've gotten a chance to meet with him a few times from him being here over and over and again. And um, it's been really neat to get to know him. But uh, he, he just came up to me before the four o'clock and he said, hey, BJ, um, I just wanted to ask you a question. I said, okay. He's like, I'm going to be doing um, a Valentine's Day message, and I just want to make sure that I'm not stepping on any toes with doing the Valentine's Day message. And I said, no, not at all. Why would you think that? He's like, well, I, I know that tomorrow night you're doing some sort, of, some sort of Valentine's Day event where you're speaking, where you're doing some sort of Valentine's Day message. I said, oh, no, no, I'm just like harassing four groups of people on stage. Like, it's totally different. And he's like, oh, all oh, right, then I got it. So I started laughing. And I was like, oh, that was really nice of him to like check with me to make sure it didn't overstep on any toes or anything. And then he's like, all right, if I could get everyone in their Bibles to open up to Genesis 29. And I'm like, no, you didn't tell me where you were gonna be. But it was really funny because, uh, but he did such an awesome job, you guys. He, he I mean, it's so great to hear these people that have taught, for a very long time, just be so perfect at what they do. And I, I just was so blessed by it. But, um, you know, so I called Gerald and, you know, cause he's at a conference, he's actually back now. But um, I called him and I just said, hey, um, how awkward is it gonna be? You know, let, let me feel the water out. You know, he just taught Genesis 29. And when I say, hey everyone, let's open our Bibles to Genesis 29. How awkward is that gonna be? He said, I have a problem. He goes, I, I bet you money that you're going to teach it nothing like he taught it. And I was like, well, let me go ahead and look at it. And I looked at it. I'm like, the truth is when Gerald came up and said, I have never heard it taught that way in my whole entire life <laughs> is the hundred percent truth. I don't even know how you would teach it that way. And yet he did. And yet it was fantastic and applicable. So the way I'm going to teach it tonight is totally different. Open your Bibles to Genesis 29. So. I want to give you a recap, though, to put it into context of what we've been talking about as you open it up to Genesis 29. See, Jacob was sent out because his brother wanted to kill him for stealing the blessing. And so he went towards Haran and arrived at a place which he would name Bethel later on. But as he went there, uh, he had basically an amazing encounter with God. But before that, as he's traveling, he was down on himself. He was uh, full of shame and anger and frustration at what he had done. And, and uh, you know, he's being sent out because his brother wants to kill him. And this will be the last time he sees either one of his parents again. And living in the circumstances he's made for himself to the point to where he shows up and he begins to grab this rock. He either laid next to him or he put it under his head or something. But, you know, you got to be in a bad spot to want to lay on a rock, Right. And so that's the comfort he has as he lays his head on a rock and he begins to go to sleep. And as he sleeps, he has a dream. And it's a dream that he dreamt that a ladder was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And God began to speak to him as this was happening and this picture was taking place. God said, I'm the Lord God of Abraham your father, and I'm the God of Isaac, and the land which you lie on, I will give to you and your descendants. And furthermore, he would speak things to him 
about how he was never going to leave him and how um, he's with you. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And it just really encouraged him. And so together, as we, as we heard this, we began to look at the dream and what the dream represented. And Jesus had also talked about in John 1 about angels ascending and descending, which sounded very similar to the same thing that Jacob was talking about. See, what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about John 1 was this, the angels ascending and descending, but the reason they were ascending and descending is because Jesus' church is that ladder. Jesus is the ladder to heaven in which we have communication with God. Jesus is the bridge between us and God. And when, when Jacob arose from this dream, as he began to just have this radical encounter with God, you could tell from that point on that there has been a change in Jacob. As we, as we read on, you're going to see a continued change in Jacob, but there was even a change in his countenance because that rock that he had laid on as an uncomfortable stone to put underneath his head now, he's beginning to pour oil on it and beginning to use it as a pillar as he begins to commemorate what had happened here. He wanted to remember this memory uh, that, that the Lord had spoke audibly to him. He wanted to consecrate the rock and this encounter that reminded him that, that God gives him peace, that God will always keep him. And, and as he began to have that reminder in his heart, he began to, to prove in his heart that, hey, I'm going to give a tenth of everything I have to God. God showed up to Jacob. It changed the way he felt. He said, I'm going to give a tenth of everything I own to you. So that's where we left off. Let's look at Genesis 29. We'll read the new scripture together, shall we? It says in Genesis 29, verse 1, so Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be there, gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and they put the stone back in the place over the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We're from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And so he said to him, is he well? And they said to him, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot go until the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, that the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and, the water, uh, the, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Man, that's quick. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that, uh, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all of these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for about a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served with seven years for Rachel, and they seemed all, it, it seemed for only a few days for him because he loved the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. Then Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give you our younger before our firstborn. Fulfill her week, uh, and we will give you this one also for this service, which you, have, uh, which you will serve me still for another seven years. 
Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, his wife also. And Laban gave his maid, Bila, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban at still another seven years. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. Lord, as I look out and I just see your people, Lord, here gathered together, Lord, I am so blessed to see everyone here, Lord God, just ready to get into your word and have you speak to them, Lord. They're not attracted to anything great about this building or anything, Lord. They, they want to hear from you. Lord Jesus, I, I, I've studied the word, Lord God. I, I know you've given me words to say, but Lord, uh, I, need, I need the strength to say them and I, and I need you to speak to your people. So Lord Jesus, would you just come now and, and, and just minister through the power of your Holy Spirit? Father, would you use this vessel to just uh, to, to just bless this congregation, Lord, the people that just so desperately need to hear you, Lord, whether they're full of pride and they need to be humbled or whether it's full of bitterness, Lord, that they just need comforting, Lord, or, or whether they're just completely broken and they need you to rebuild them, Lord. I just pray that you would do all the things that only your Holy Spirit can do, Father. Lord, we know when this message goes out, Lord, that the enemy hates it, and Lord, he comes against it, but Lord, Lord, he has no power here, so Lord, we just pray that you would just uh, bind him in your name, Jesus, and that you would send him on his way, Lord. This would be a beautiful time of spirit speaking to spirit, and you would rule and reign in this room. So Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for everything you've done with us, and Lord, we just pray once again, Lord, that you would teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at verses one through three with me. One through three says this, so Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was over the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. So Jacob is continuing on his journey after the amazing dream in which God spoke to him and gave him such a vivid vision. He's encouraged. He's strengthened to continue. He's strengthened to continue on. He's encouraged by God's voice and by God's promise to continue. Now we see that Jacob arrives at a well. He just sees there's a lot of, there's a lot of livestock, there's a lot of sheep, there's a lot of different things at this well, there's a lot of people, and, and you know, we already know by so many amazing stories at wells that something's going to happen, right? It seems like there are so many stories in the Bible that have something to do with the well, even one that had to do with his father, you know, basically meeting his, his, his father meeting his mother at a well. So there's interactions that happen at wells that God puts people together to, to, to do neat things at, at these wells. Wells would be a place where people would gather together and they would feed their animals and they would water their animals. But while they did that, they would talk and converse with one another. So there was a lot of that happening. I mean, Abraham's servant stood and he waited for people to come and go. And he was like, okay, so Lord, you're going to show me the one that is for my master, the, the one that I should bring back. Basically, if you picture in our today's culture, it's hard to do because we really don't have anything like that. But, you know, at business offices, you always picture the water cooler, Right. I mean, the water cooler where everyone like gets up from work for a minute and like, oh man, Jim just got up. So now I need to get up. So Jim, uh, how was that softball game? You know, I don't know what you guys talk about. How's that softball game? I don't know. How's your yard growing? It's not. And we have dirt. So do I. So I, you know, whatever, whatever we're talking about in Yucca Valley, you know, uh, you know, so it's kind of like the idea of like a bunch of people gathered together around that meet there frequently. And, and, you know, for when you're a kid, you know, it would be the equivalent of like the pencil sharpener, right? I and mean, that's the place that you went whenever you got like new shoes, you'd want to show someone. So it'd be like go time. Whenever you'd go up to the pencil sharpener, your best friend would get up to you and you're like, we're just sharpening our pencils, nice shoes. You know, that's kind of how it works, right? So look at verses four through 10. As we begin to see at this well, it says, and Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. And, and so he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, look, it is still high day. Is it not time for the cattle to be gathered together? Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone away in the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. 
Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his, his mother's brother. So you got to understand, as, as Jacob is traveling, he's, he's been traveling, and since he left Bethel, he's going further up, and he has, I mean, there, there's no... I know this sounds really almost cheesy, but there's no GPS. There's no road signs saying a little bit further to Laban. There's none of this stuff. In fact, if you've ever been over to that area, it's so desolate and, and it, there's so much desert. It all looks the same. And once again, I know you're having a hard time, you know, imagining a desert, but it's <laughs> desert. And, and so he kind of, you're kind of going and, 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 and the fact that he's there at this time is actually pretty amazing. So now he finds that he's at this place. He has no clue where he is and he has no clue that he's in Haran. So he begins to ask, where am I? <laughs> right? That's basically what he's asking him. Um, I've traveled for a little bit. Where am I? And they, and they basically tell him, uh, we're from Haran. And he's like, well, isn't that good news? Because that's where I'm headed. And so now he begins to investigate a little bit further. You got to understand when he left and, and he left for this place, he had no clue if Laban was well. He had no clue if, if Laban would even take him in. He had no idea what was happening. He was just following the orders in which his father and mother told him to and trusting in God now to do a work. So he asked, do you know Laban? And they said, yes. He says, is he well? And they said, yes. The locals answer both of the questions. And in fact, at that point, you even see Rachel coming. I mean, you really can't beat God's timing, can you? Think about the difference of him urging God's timing and making God do something as opposed to waiting on God's timing, right? I mean, when he tried to force his own hand at something he already owned, the blessing, uh, you know, that, that the, the, younger was go, uh, the older was going to serve the younger, the thing that God had promised that was going to be his anyways, and he got scared and he wanted it, so he stole it, and look at all the problems it caused. Now, after having this talk with the Lord, he begins to trust in God, and now as he shows up, there's people at the well that are telling him, oh, you're exactly where you need to be. Oh, and by the way, Here's uh, one of his daughters coming right now. God's timing is way better than your timing, and it's perfect all the time. That's why we need to wait on the Lord. Now we see Laban's daughters. One of Laban's daughters is out with her sheep. And what takes place next, church, what takes place next is wonderfully hilarious, okay? But it's easy to read past it, not catch it. But if you read it like I do, it's fantastic. Because it's such a man thing to do. What he did is pretty manly as you fall in love and as you're smitten by the most beautiful girl you've ever seen. Because that's basically what happens. So first things first, he's been talking to people about where he is. And he, at this point, sees Rachel and she's coming. And she has all these sheep with her. And now he needs to ditch the guys he's been talking to. Did he not do that? That's exactly what he did. Thank you for the information, gentlemen. Now it's time for you to go and gather your flock and Go along your way. In fact, his words was, look, it's still high day. It's not time, uh, it, it, it's not time for, is it not time for the cattle to be gathered together and water the sheep? Go and feed them. He had just met these nice people and they had just told him where he was. And now he's like, get lost. Like that's, that's what he's telling them to do. Like the pretty girl's here, now you can go. Man thing number two, totally. When, when men are smitten with a woman, he begins to want to put on his best look for her right? He begins to not know this woman at all, but boy, he begins to peacock his feathers out, right? He's like, I'm going to give her my best. It's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Muscles and generosity are on the way, lady. Be still your beating heart because it's coming at you full speed. It's exactly what's happening. Man, think about the crazy things you've done when you try to impress your wives. When you were dating, think about the insanity that was your life. What you did every day to try to make yourself look good, to put on a certain cologne, to wear a certain sweater, whatever it was, anything you could do. I'll tell you what I did. I'll tell you what I did right now. I told the four o'clock service I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. I don't care. It's on, it's on record. And the guys probably listened to it, whatever. But here's what happened. Audrey, I've loved this woman since I was a wee child, very small. And uh, she's never liked me, and that's okay. I'm persistent. 
And uh, finally, she worked at the same establishment I did. We both worked at CSN and The Effect, which is a radio station that mirrors, its, mirrors, mirrors each other. And um, she invites me to go do something. We'd been talking a lot at that point. And she goes, hey. I'm like, hi. She's like, do you want to go somewhere with me? And I'm like, more than anything in the world. And then she goes, great, because I got invited to uh, this other girl's, I'm not going to say her name, but this other girl's wedding, and I would love you to go with me. And I'm like, A, I was invited to this wedding, and B, that's my ex-girlfriend, like, from, like, six, seven months ago. And she didn't invite me. So that'd be super duper awkward, but I wanted to go so badly, but I was like, oh, you know what? Can we go anywhere else? Like, and she's like, no, that's really where I want to go. And so I was like, I'm sorry, I can't go. So my friend goes, I'll take you. <laughs> and so I'm like, all right, well, that was messed up, but okay. And so he takes her out and he takes her to, I don't know, miniature golf and a bunch of fun things before the wedding because of course. And uh, I begin to <laughs> text her. I'm like, so what are you guys doing? There she's like, oh, right now we just got done with the wedding. Now we're at Sherry's. It's a place that has lots of pie. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I just managed to stumble upon Sherry's. I like walk in, I'm like, hey, hey, you guys, what are you doing here? And since they're sitting across the table from one another, I sit next to her and I'm like, what's going on? You know, and I'm just talking across the table and I began, I mean, I, you guys, I did everything I could to impress her. I mean, I had the one sweater she liked that I owned and I had the one cologne that she could deal with. And I did everything I could possibly do at that point. Did my hair somehow. And uh, I, just, I just really wanted to impress her. And, and this guy was like cramping my style. So I looked across and now, now everyone please forgive me. I look across and I notice he's wearing a shirt. And the shirt is of a band called Less Than Jake and they're a ska band. And I knew this because I know a lot about music and I just know that she doesn't like that kind of music. But I knew who they were. But I said, hey, what shirt are you wearing? What is that? And he goes, oh, it's a Less Than Jake shirt. I said, Less Than Jake, what is that? He's like, oh, it's a band. I said, what kind of band? He's like, it's a ska band. I'm like, oh, ska? I hate ska. She's like, so do I. I'm like, really? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to go real soon. It's really cold outside. I said, do you need a ride home? And he's like, no, I got it. I said, but don't you have a convertible? It's pretty cold. I, I don't have a convertible. Would you like to ride with me? And she's like, sure, I'll ride with you. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. So <laughs> I put her in my car and we, I drive her back to her house. And she begins to tell me on the phone that she's had, she had some allergies, some problems. And so I'm like, I can, I can take care of that. My mom has all sorts of allergies. So, <laughs> so I drive like 20 miles out to the country instead of going to the drugstore. And I'm like, mom, mom. She's like, what? I'm like, I need to know what takes care of allergies. Like right now, she's like, well, what kind? And I'm like, she's got like snivelly nose and she's kind of, I don't know, just give me something. She's like, okay. And so she gives it to me and I drive 20 miles back to give her two pills. But now I'm like, I pull in the driveway and I'm like, I need to go to the grocery store and buy a bottle of water. Because that made sense in my mind at the time. Like she doesn't have tap water. So <laughs> I drove all the way to the grocery store, got her water and I just delivered it to her. And from that point on, she was like, he's like the sweetest dude ever. And I was like, I really, really like you. Like, I really do. Please, I've liked you forever. Please love me, you know. And it ended up working out for me. But you got to understand what Jacob's doing here. Basically, this big, heavy thing is sitting there. And she comes and he's like, oh, this heavy thing? Let me go ahead and move that for you. You know, I could just see him like, oh, yes. You know, and then afterwards, I'll go ahead and take, you just have a seat. I'm going to take care of all your sheep. Man, I truly believe this is the truth, though. What he did was the right thing. To take care of her and to show her that he loved her so much that he would cherish her and that he would serve her. Here's the problem, guys. For our one and only, we need to not lose this. Problem is, is we do. Problem is, we work so hard to get them to date us or get them to marry us, and then you know, we go that extra mile and then it seems like once they marry us, we either let ourselves go or we just forget that like we should be still trying to earn our wife's affection because we love her so much. We should be wanting to carry the burden for one another. We should be wanting to help her around the house. 
We should be wanting to make life easier for one another and not losing that. Not, not giving her something like we tricked her into marrying us and now she married a big schlub, right? <laughs> but instead, really being present in the house with the children. Present in the lives of her and making sure that you're, you're fulfilling her needs. And, you know, there's one thing that there's a lot of pastors that say, and they say the words, happy wife, happy life, you know. And I agree with that. But let me tell you, there's one thing that couples lose as you sit and you talk with them during counseling. And it's always the, we forgot about date nights. We forgot about doing things for one another. The wife admits that she is, you know, forgot about things to please her husband, you know, and, and the little small things that he liked, and he no longer does the things that she likes, and they just became roommates in a house, and then it's like, well, why even stay married? Satan gets in there and gets to have a heyday. We can't lose that stuff. We can't just give up on one another, and you hear the term happy wife, happy life, and I do agree with that because men, sometimes that's the only thing that we can control can't necessarily control all the times how your wife's going to react to you treating her well. Sometimes your wife's going through some stuff and you're doing everything you can to make her happy. And so you're telling yourself happy wife, happy life. But here's the truth, ladies, men and, and ladies, the effort is mutual. It has to be 100%, 100%. Every marriage is 100% of both people trying to make a marriage work. And so if it's up to me, I think we should change it to happy spouse, happy house. Amen? Because does it not take an extreme amount of commitment from each other to make it work? But men, you cannot be the first to lose it. You have to fight for that same, that passion that you had for her before that you'll always have. And so now look at, now look at Jacob after he shows her how much he loves her and how strong he is. He says, then Jacob kissed Rachel, now, okay, and lifted up his voice and he wept. And Jacob told Rachel, that he was his father's relative and that he, uh, he was Rebekah's son. So he ran and told her father. And it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, embraced him, uh, and kissed him, and brought him to the house. So he was told, uh, sorry, sorry. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban uh, said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for about a month. So this is pretty, this is pretty crazy. Because now he's just met her. She's beautiful. Is it just me, men, or did he move pretty quick? Right, that's a bold, bold move. And, and in fact, I guess when you know, you know. But still, he went in for the, the, the kiss pretty quick. And you got to take it from Rachel's perspective. You just meet this guy, and he's doing this nice stuff for you. And you're like, oh, what a sweetheart. And then he kisses you, and you're like, oh, well, okay. And then the next minute, he's weeping and crying and, like, yelling. Is that not a weird first impression, right? You got to understand, she had no clue what was going on that day. She went to go take her sheep and to water them. That was her job. She had no clue that she was going to get married to the guy at the well. She had no clue that day when she took him that she was going to be getting kissed by a guy at a well. Once again, church, God's timing is way better than our timing. Oftentimes we see young, young girls especially trying to force the hand of God in their own marriage or trying to get married. Gosh, you hear, you hear some of these young girls, and if you're one of them, please forgive me. But you hear them, and they're like, I'm almost 18 and a half, and I'm not married yet. You know? I'm waiting for God's timing, but he is taking a very long time. And you're like, chill out. Because God's timing is always the best. And the thing is, is God moves fast when he moves. Here she had no clue that that day was going to change her life, and that day changed her life for everything. But reading this, you can imagine this scenario. Jacob has over and over and over again probably heard from his dad, Isaac, how he met his, his, his mom. His mom was met at a well, so he wants to do exactly what God wants him to do at this point. He's had, he's had a relationship with God. He's had a moment with God. And so what he wants to do is he wants to just jump right into this thing. He's like, oh my gosh, the same thing that happened to my dad is going to happen to me. I'm ready to make this thing official. I already gave her a kiss. Like, we are ready to go. And now Laban comes running to them. They're having a family reunion. He's never seen Laban for like forever. And so they're given hugs and all these things. And then at that point, they do the catch up. How's everyone doing? How are you doing? Is everything going oh well? And small talk. Now look what happens in verse 15. Then Laban says to Jacob, after, keep in mind this is after a month. 
Because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? That might sound like, oh, well, he's nice. He's going to pay him for his wages. You know, that's a sweet thing to do. But here's the truth. Did Jacob ask to serve him? Did he? He's hanging out for a month. He doesn't want to serve. And here he's like, well, you've been here for a month. It's time for you to get to work. So what, what, how much are you going to charge me to be a servant? Uh-oh. The, the, the trickster has just met the shrewd dealer, right? And being it, it, with him for a month, he's basically letting him know, you're not going to be a freeloader for me. You've been here for a month. Do you guys realize what hired servants did? They did everything that no one else wanted to do. And all you CBI students are like, amen. Like, we understand, right? Joshua Springs Bible College kids are like, you have no clue. Like, you know, because the truth is, is servant, in being a servant, you're doing jobs that are excruciating hard, excruciating gross. It's like what no one wants to do. And truthfully, Jacob, even though he worked hard, he likely had no experience in any of this. So let's see how Jacob replies here. Verses 16 to 19. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So cultures and customs of this day, you guys got to understand that what, what they would do is they'd give, a, they'd give like a substantial gift or a dowry to, to the father, basically saying, I'm sorry, I took your daughter. Here, have a gift, right? But even more than that, I would say, I'm taking your daughter, but I promise you I'll take care of her. And here's a gift to prove this is just a small part of what I can do for your family. So it's something that in, 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 in customs, this would happen. Well, Laban had two daughters, one who he just met and who we just met. And the other one would be Leah, whose eyes were delicate. It's kind of a weird way to explain someone, right? Like, oh, her eyes were delicate, right? But this can mean one of three different things. Number one, there could just be something special about her eyes. Have you ever met someone that's like, wow, their eyes are just awesome, right? I was going to tell a story about Grumpy and I and my awesome eyes, but I'm not going to, right? But someone that just has awesome eyes. Or it could be that there was something physically wrong with her eyes. She couldn't see well or something, there was an ailment. Or it could mean that they weren't as vibrant as Rachel's. But either way, Jacob is crazy about Rachel and does not care about Leah at all. And so here in Laban's house, he wants Jacob as a servant. And, and so Jacob decides, um, you know, Laban's like, if you want to stay here, you have to work. And so Jacob's like, hey, listen, I'll give you seven years for Rachel. Man, is that a lot of time? Seven years of being a servant doing the worst work? That's crazy. Jacob loved Rachel, love at first sight, and he's willing to do anything for her. And as much as we rag on Jacob, as much as we talk about Jacob, excuse me, we have to realize, and Jacob was wealthy, but he didn't have it with him, that even though Jacob was wealthy, his character was one that would work hard for, for his wife. And I'm just going to, you guys, I'm just going to sit down real fast just because this medication sometimes makes me a little dizzy. So just forgive me. And I just got to sit down because I'm like, woo, flying right now. So I'm going to feel like a total weirdo right now. The work, so. So Wow, this is weird. All right, cool. So this speaks to something of who Jacob was, right? Jacob was a man who, um, he had character, even though he had a lot of flaws. He could have just as easy said, Seven, yeah, I'm not doing anything for her. I, she's, she should be happy to marry me. She should be happy that she's even marrying who I am. Instead, he agrees. He says, listen, I will, I will be your servant for seven years. And, and, and 
you know, even him being understanding like what servants do, he's like, I will do that for you. And so in verses 20 through 28, it says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few, year, uh, only a few days to him because he had loved her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her, and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to the daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And, uh, and he said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? When then have you deceived, why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, is it not done in your country? Uh, wait, sorry. It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week and I will give you this one also for the service which you will serve me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as wife only. You know, one thing I loved about Jacob when I read this, he, it said that it only seemed like a few days. Seven years only seemed like a few days to him. And you know why? Because he gladly worked hard for something he loved. Every day showing up, knowing what was waiting for him, he said, you know what? I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna be joyful because I'm working for a prize that I'm going to attain. But unbeknownst to him, to, you know, here we have Laban and he has this plan to give his daughter Leah to Jacob. And so he, he even puts on this giant feast. And do you, is it just me? Or is that feast even more of a slap in the face to Jacob than anything else? He did a whole feast like he was going to give Rachel to him, brought everyone in, you know, and, and when you think, you know, I, it's just so offensive to me that he would do something like this. And, and the question comes for every man and maybe woman in here. On that night, that honeymoon night, how did Jacob not know that it was not Rachel? Did you guys all wonder that question? What about you guys over here? Yes? How, as <laughs> this giant thing is in my way, how did, you, how did he not realize? I mean, you would think you would know, but the truth is, is the word feast, you gotta focus on. The word feast is not only eating, but it's also drinking. Hey, thank you for that. We can move that, you can just completely move it. Um, but it's eating and it's drinking. Once again, let me tell you, I know that this church hits hard on drinking. And some of you are like, they're so almost legalistic about it. And here's the truth. If you're having a glass of wine with your family or whatever it is, I'm not going to come at you and I'm not going to look down on you. That's not, my, that's not my spot to judge. But I will tell you this. I have never known anyone to drink heavily I then wake up the next morning after they're hung over and go, man, after I drank last night, I made a really good decision I found out. Like, I went and helped orphans when I got totally smashed. Like, no one has ever said that ever when they got drunk. Or when they woke up drunk, they've never said, you know, I created something beautiful last night. Like, I, cre I created something. I invented something while I was drunk. And here's the truth. Chances are, because, I mean, if, if one of those things were different... If one of these things I'm gonna tell you were different, something would have changed, but the truth was, his senses were dulled, the custom of the day changed everything, because the custom of the day, church, was they would have a veil over their face, and it's not like the veil you see the bride walk out where it's kind of like a see-through mesh. It was like a veil veil, and it was probably dark by the time they got to the honeymoon suite. So if he would have had his senses about it, maybe he would have noticed the other two, right? But the truth was, he was completely oblivious to everything. And men, can you imagine that scenario? Where all of a sudden, you've just had your honeymoon, and you wake up, and you look over, and you're wiping the, the goobers out of your eyes because you had just, just, it's been great. You've been working seven years for this woman. And you look over to look at her in the mornings to see the rest of your life. And her delicate little eyes are staring right back at you. We don't even know what that means. So it could definitely even be a problem with her eyes. And she's looking at you and she's like, you know, and you're like, what did I do? This isn't right. What happened? Where's the pretty sister, right? Where's the one that I married? And you know, you guys can say whatever you want, but that's the way the word describes it. He woke up and he, he instantly realized that he was tricked. 
He was tricked. And Jacob became furious, right? Jacob walked in there. This was not a friendly conversation. In the Bible, if you want to read it, just monotone. You can make it sound very, very kind. But the truth was, he basically went up to him and says, you know what I did for Rachel. Then Jacob says to Laban these words. He says, why then have you deceived me? That sounds like a nice way to say things. But the truth is that word deceived is not friendly talk. He's saying you were treacherous with me. You were treasonous with me. How dare you betray me? He was so upset at the fact that someone would deceive him like that. And all the time, Jacob is sitting here shouting the words, unfair, how dare you? Yet church, can I ask you a question? Is this not so similar to what Jacob had done to Esau? It's almost exactly the same. Because here's the truth. Jacob had exchanged the younger for the older for a blessing. Meanwhile, Laban exchanged the older for the younger in marriage. On top of that, just like Jacob's deceit, it left tons of people hurting in the wake of his deceitfulness. And in the same way, here we have Laban and poor Leah. Can you imagine the way she feels? She's just obeying her father. She's just doing what she's supposed to do in culture. And she wakes up and her husband can't stand her. It seems like a messed up thing to do to your daughter. Now Rachel, she has to see her husband be with, or the person that her husband's worked for to be with her sister. And poor Jacob is just hurting. I mean, it's left all sorts of people destroyed in the wake of that sin. And the saddest part about it as I read it, church, is none of this stuff had to be in Jacob's life. Do we understand that none of that stuff had to be there? God's sovereign will was not for this to happen to him. Right? God and his immense blessing did not take away his promise from Jacob. God was still going to bless Jacob. God was still the chosen son. God, God had a plan for him. But here's the truth, church. Every single one of our sins, there's great consequence for. That's why we're told not to sin. Because God knows the pain it's going to cause you. He loves you. He's not, causing, he's not calling you to not do these things because he feels like he wants to ruin your fun. Or your 10 years of partying. Or your drug addiction. Or your child out of wedlock. Or that goes on and on and on. All those things might seem like good things in the moment. But down the road it hurts. And he knows it's going to hurt. And the truth is, is none of it had to be there. But the truth is God is going to use it to teach Jacob things about himself. That he never even knew were there. God's going to teach him how much he's going to be there for him. And it's easy for us to, is it not easy for us to be upset? It's not easy for us to be upset and when, we're, when we're deceived and being wronged and we're angry about things and we slam our fists on things all the while closing our eyes to the way that we have treated others. We're the first to shout injustice, but we're the last. We're the last ones to shout justice when we're the ones, being, the, the ones doing the wrong. Church, I think this is why it's important that when we are wronged, when someone has wronged us, that we look for mercy and forgiveness as opposed to just, I want justice. Because the truth is, is if God gave every one of us justice, there'd be none of us here. Every one of us here are deserving of death. We, have, we became enemies of God. We became darkness because of our wickedness. But yet Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins that we may live eternity, that he is the ladder between us and God, and he's redeemed us. So before you want to shout justice for that person that's wronged me, just destroy them. Shout forgiveness and mercy because that's what you have been measured out greatly. You know, Laban here, he's a deceiver. There's no doubt about it. 
But what did he end up doing with his deceitfulness, right? What did he end up doing? He began to justify it, right? He began to use excuses for his lying and his deceiving. He pointed to the customs of the day. Well, I, I couldn't possibly give you Rachel. Jacob, come on. Don't you know our culture? Oh, you don't know it? Oh, well, I have to give you Leah before I give you Rachel. The whole time, he understood what he was doing. But the truth is, when he does things like this, I like to call it a sin defense mechanism. So you don't feel corrected for your sin. What we do is we begin to give half-truths, right? Well, what I said to them was not completely a lie because the place actually existed. I just didn't tell them what would happen to them when they got there. Well, the person I hooked up with, you know, whatever it is, there's just so many scenarios where you can say, well, I just didn't give them the full story. So it's not really a lie. That is called defending your sin. It is absolutely a lie. There was no doubt what Jacob was asking for. In fact, it's so funny as you read through the scriptures over and over and over again, he's like, I will do this for Rachel. I love Rachel. Don't get it twisted. It's all about Rachel. I kissed Rachel first. I met her for five seconds and I kissed her. I love Rachel. He understood that he loved Rachel, and so he knew that he could trick him into working for him longer. He saw that he had a good countenance about him when he worked those seven years, and that it didn't trouble him to work hard for seven years. In fact, he wanted him to work seven more. I'm sure whenever Jacob saw Rachel, there was a sparkle in their eyes, and he's like, oh, I'm going to milk this till, till I can't milk it anymore, right? It makes me wonder what point he figured that out. Did he figure out at the beginning when he, when he agreed to the seven years or did he figure it out in the middle of the seven years? Either way, it was messed up. And Jacob loved her so much, church. He said, okay, I'll go ahead and agree to seven more years. Seven more years of serving you for her. Man, is that not something different than our culture? My culture and what movies have taught me is whenever there's a problem, I should be able to solve it within two hours. Because by the time the problem starts, two and a half hours later, it's fixed. But here's the truth. Good things that we have in life, they're always worth persevering for. Good things that we have are always worth working hard for. If more of us had, had to work for our spouse, like Jacob had to work for his I would have to tend to think that the divorce rate in America would be much lower. If you had to work seven years for your wife, laboring, doing the worst work ever, and then you got tricked and you had to do seven more years for your wife, something tells me when you got in a fight about something or an issue that happened in your marriage, You wouldn't be like, you know what? I just think it's time for us to part and go different ways. I just don't think we are in love anymore. I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. No, if you invested 14 years working for her, you'd be like, listen, I worked 14 years for that woman and there's nothing she couldn't do to make me leave her because that's 14 years of my life to even get her. Right? Right? There's not one man in here that would ever turn his back on his wife. There's not one man in here that would abandon her. There's not one man in here that would cheat on her if he had to work 14 years for her. Great things require great sacrifice. Great things that you love require great perseverance, hard work, and most of all, you don't think that that required a great amount of trust in God? as he began to agree to seven more years of hard labor. All right, Lord, I'm gonna trust you on this one. I'm, 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 I'm just gonna continue on. And look what happens, verse 28 through 30. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his wife Bila to the daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel. And he also loved Rachel much more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. Do you guys catch what just happened? Jacob got Rachel before the seven years was up. So as soon as he was, uh, his week was done with Leah, as 
weird and wrong as that sounds, as soon as he's done with that week, he's able to go and get Rachel and then, you know, just go ahead and work off your seven years as you have Rachel too. He kept his side of the bargain. The trickster, the heel catcher, the deceitful one kept his side of the bargain. Can you see God working things out in Jacob that used to, not, that used to be very present in his life? God is teaching Jacob things the hard way. If we're not willing to learn the easy way, we will learn the hard way. And he's sitting here learning and he's like, I understand, Lord. I'm going to work. I'm going to do what you told me to the first time. I'm not going to steal her. I'm not going to run back on my promise. I'm not going to run back on my word. And he worked another seven years. Can you imagine? I mean, the fleshly side of him, he already probably had a plan to get him and Rachel out of there together, right? He probably already had like underground tunnels dug that he was going to go all the way back home with her. I mean, he had plans. He was pro at tricking people. Instead, he just wanted to see God's plan for his life. Instead of doing things his way, he just wanted to see God defend him. He wanted to see God take care of him, not complaining, not plotting his revenge, not sitting for years and going, woe is me, but instead, I'm going to work for what the Lord has given me. I also like that he didn't act on impulse because he realized it's not only affecting him anymore. He saw what his sin did in affecting his whole family. Now he realizes that this sin would affect not only him, but also his wife, Rachel. And he loved Rachel. I'm gonna have the worship team come back up here. But here's the truth. We're ending on a really weird part of scripture. Okay, I realize where I left us, right? Where I have left us is exactly here. Then Jacob went into Rachel, but yet he loved Rachel more than Leah and served with Laban still 10 years. Why that's weird is because you feel like, man, Leah really got the bad end of the stick here. Because after everything that happened, he still loves Rachel more than her. But I'm going to tell you something. Come back next week. Genesis 30. God has a plan for Leah. There's a lot of us in here that don't understand what we're going through and we don't think God understands our problems. You feel used, you feel taken advantage of. Listen, God had a plan for Leah. And we're gonna learn about that next week. So I want you to come back and to hear that, especially if you're one of those people that feel used up. But you gotta realize that God's plan is greater. But what I want us to drive home on what I wanted us to focus on as we leave this place is the difference in Jacob before and after the encounter from God. Before this radical changing, life-changing encounter from God, he was a trickster, a he, just heel catcher. He was living up to his name. And now you're gonna see him continuing to trust in the Lord, continuing to trust in the Lord continuing to trust in the Lord with every step. And he's going he's gonna to fail. He's going to have problems. But every day he's growing and God is teaching him things. The fact that God was still there for him after everything he had done had changed his life forever as he moved away from the name that he was once, so, once known by, even from his own family. Church, we too need that progression. The same way we need it in our marriage to never let it go and to continue to invest in it, we need to do the same with God. We need the progression to continue. The fact that, yes, we're saved. Yes, that's great. I, I love that we're saved. But let our walk with the Lord reflect His goodness. Let our walk with the Lord show someone that we are different because we've spent time with Him. Here's the truth. If you were known as someone like the heel catcher, you were known as a Jacob. As you walk longer with the Lord, they should never, they should start not recognizing you that is anymore because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your heart. So let us strive by the power of the Holy Spirit to daily walk with Him, that God would go with us wherever we go. Let that fact that simple fact that God is with you, forgive those people that have wronged you. 
don't scream for justice. Instead, forgive them. God has poured out an unmeasurable amount of grace to you. And the biggest way you're going to stand out to people is how you treat them. Maybe you were one to instantly react on every whim and action that would come your way. You would get angry at someone when they wronged you. You want to see how someone's going to take notice of your life? Go ahead and try forgiving them and see what happens then. They're going to see a change in you. And guess what happens then? God's like, we're going to work on some other things now. People are going to start not recognizing you anymore for who you once were, but who God has intended you to be. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. Lord, I thank you that you are here with us. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, that your message went out. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, Genesis 29 went out twice and taught two separate ways. But Lord, I thank you that you have not forgotten about Leah. Lord, that you have a plan for her. Lord, you have a plan for Leah and Jacob. So Lord Jesus, we just pray, Lord, as we come before you right now, Lord, would you move in our hearts as we give you that, that freedom and that reign to do so. And Lord, let us continue to walk with you and look more like you. Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, just for the strength to continue on with this message. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that I had a chair up here that I could look like some Joshua Tree hipster as I teach. Lord, I do. I just thank you that I'm able to continue. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, just for the short amount of dizzy spells that I have. Lord, I feel better now. And Lord, I just pray that you would just continue the work, Lord, that you've done at Joshua Springs. Lord, that you would continue to bless us. And Lord, that you'd bless your church, Lord. Other churches and groups that are gathered around Yucca Valley and the Morongo Basin, Lord God, gathering together and worshiping your name. Lord, let us have your focus on our hearts. Lord, what you want to see, and that's people come to know you, Lord. You want to, you want to, you want all of us to come to you. So Lord Jesus, I just pray that that would be our goal wherever we go, is to reflect your goodness in our life. So Lord Jesus, would you just move more in our town? Father, but as you move in our town, Lord God, it's going to, it's going to be your church, Lord, your people doing it. So Lord, would you empower us to do bigger and greater things than any generation before us has done? Lord, let us never become complacent. Lord, you, your, your mercies are new every morning. Lord, your power is great. So Lord, let us never box you in, but Lord, let us just pour out love to those we come in contact with. And so Lord, we just love you. We thank you. We honor you. We respect you. We fear you. Lord, you're so good to us. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen.